everybody. Welcome to Expert Interrogation today on this. We got a lot of snow here in Alton, Illinois um, on this nice Tuesday. We've got Brett Culp. I'm super, super just excited to have him on today. Um, some exciting things happen with him. How you doing, Brett? I'm doing great, man, and I'm in Tampa, Florida, and there's no snow here. <laughs> Chris, how about you? No snow in Chattanooga, Tennessee, but it is a nasty storm right now, so it will be interesting if the lights stay on uh, here in the studio. But uh, they're calling for snow tonight, but they always call for snow, and it never happens. So now The weather the weather people, I don't think they know what's going on anymore. Well, I just want to uh, welcome everybody today. I uh, just got a few quick things. We got, of course, a, a lot of people in guest mode again. Uh, anybody who wants to interact in the chat or uh, you know ask questions using right below Brett, you'll see a submit a question uh, button. And basically, in the second half of the show, the last 30 minutes, we'll be taking questions and uh, doing a rapid fire Q and A with Brett. So you'll want to be able to do that, and you'll just log in via Facebook, Twitter, or a, a Spreecast account, and you'll be able to do that. Um, we try to keep this very uh, business oriented to kind of help you in the business world of things. We got some. Some fun things to talk to Brett about, and uh, so when you're asking your questions, try to keep them in that realm. Don't get too, uh, uh, you know, too many questions on the tech side. We're trying to stay away from that. But other than that, we want to make sure we make the best of this hour, and uh, we welcome everybody. And here we go. So, so Brett, we know you've got an awesome uh, Batman documentary, which I've donated on both rounds that you've done here now, and you have an amazing, amazing trailer, which I'll link up here in just a second to share with everybody, but tell us a little bit about your journey, because you used to have experience, if I'm not mistaken, I might be saying that wrong, back when you had your training and your stuff before, it was just Brett Colt Films, is that right? Yeah, ask the end of that question again. I lost you for a second. Back, back, oh. it just stuttered on me. You know, take, take us back and guide us a little oh. bit up to the documentary and what you do right now. Kind of blanking on me. Can you hear me, Chris? All right, I heard what he said, Brett, so I'm going to repeat it. Yeah, Michael, you're having some yeah, issues up there. Basically, what he's, what he's trying to ask is kind of walk us through just sort of where you were with running your production comp just just very briefly kind of give us the history of your company leading up to this documentary yeah so um, I started my I filmed my first wedding I got started in the video production filmmaking world as a wedding filmmaker and uh, filmed my first wedding over 15 years ago and um, did that for a long long time and still really enjoy that, and I'm still part of that, still do about 10 weddings a year. Uh, but we built a, a very large, I mean by standards, particularly 10 years ago, uh, a pretty large wedding video company, and we were focused on the, the luxury wedding and event market. Uh, we had at one time about 10 people on staff. This was back before the economy did what it did. And um, we had a pretty large, large group of people doing stuff. We were truly a production company, um, and we were filming, editing. There was bustle all the time going through our office, and absolutely loved weddings, and was you know full time gung ho weddings. And again, still love weddings. It's still part of my business and part of my life. Um, but then when the economy changed, it, it turned into a different world for me. And and frankly, I'm pretty glad that it did. Uh, because it forced me out of my comfort zone and to get into some world and some ways of working and doing business that, that in retrospect were much better for me and much better for my temperament and my talent set than managing a company of nine people, nine other people. Uh, that really wasn't what I was most excited about and what I was best at, but it's what I kind of got to as the company grew. And so what, what happened over the course of the past five years is that I've changed from really being a production company um, to really thinking more as a producer and thinking more uh, as a top level, how can I make something happen and then bring the resources together to make it happen. And so I think about that that way on, in every single project I work on, whether it's a wedding or corporate project or this documentary project. Um, so um, anyway, that's that's kind of what I'm what I've been focused on uh, for the past little while. Gotcha. Well, so 
we want to talk about the documentary and what I think is super exciting is that so many guys have they go into business for themselves especially if they're going into you know the filming <clears throat> space where they're going to be filming things and they maybe they want to make movies maybe they want to make documentaries maybe they want to do those things but they got into it and they got into weddings they got into corporate video work and now it's been eight years or however many years and they still haven't touched a passion project or something yeah. for themselves on a personal level in all this time because they've gotten so swamped and they don't know how to they don't know how to do it. And so how would you say you've yeah. been able to kind of juggle balance life, your family, this documentary, the business and, and what's that kind of look like? What's your business look like now and, and how are you kind of being able to manage that and fit this documentary into it? Because it's definitely a pretty massive uh, undertaking. Yeah. It is. It is a massive undertaking. I mean, it's. It's been. This has been a part-time job for the better part of a year um, to do this. Uh, and and originally, it was just kind of something I was playing around with, and then it just every step of the way, it's become bigger. It's become more serious. It's become more of a of an adventure. And so, um, you know, the issue at the beginning was trying to get a sense, I mean, you guys talk, have talked about it a lot over the past many months, of the numbers, understanding the numbers in your business, and really understanding the financial dynamics of the business. So I've gotten to the point where I know, you know, on every project, how many days I'm going to need to invest in it. And I know how much I need to charge to pay for those days to take care of the business expenses and the personal expenses that I have uh, on any given month. So, you know, if I can't get in a project um, enough to cover that daily rate, then I can't take the project or I need to alter the scope of the project. So essentially what I did was, was once I understood what that rate was and looked at my life, I said, okay, now how can I get my business to the point where I'm only working 15 days a month, but in those 15 days, I'm generating financially what I need to keep my business going and keep my life going. So, and, and that meant being very careful about how I spent my money in the business. It meant my family being very careful about how we spend our money as a family because this is, this doing this project is more than just a me project. My whole family, my wife, my two kids, We've been involved in it from the start, and there have been some things we've had to do or not do because of this. And so it wasn't about, instead of taking a family vacation, taking that money and it going to the film. It wasn't about that. It was about knowing that on any given month, I was going to work less. And I was going to work less in terms of the business, in terms of the normal paid projects, so that I could invest that time into a personal project. So that's where the numbers become extremely important is really understanding what your numbers are so that you can reach a point where you can say, you know what, I'm going to take two days a month and I'm going to invest them in this project and I'm going to know why I'm investing them in this project so that I can get this return. Now sometimes it's like what we're doing, which is you're trying to get a big scope project together and now, you know, even though this is a not-for-profit film, there are a lot of things about this that are an investment for me in my where I'm headed career-wise, where I'm going in the future, all that kind of stuff. Um, but um, but the issue is still that this is an investment for me in, in terms of what I'm doing and what I'm trying to do as a as a filmmaker and as a production company. So um, so so that's always the issue is trying to figure that out. And again, this one's a huge scope. But the first project we did that was a personal project that we did in 2011 was a much smaller project. It was much smaller. Our goals were much less lofty. But then once that project was done, sharing it and giving it to the world expanded the way people thought about me, expanded the way they thought about my business, expanded who I was as a storyteller and what I could accomplish and what people saw I could accomplish, which then led to many people having more faith in me to do this which allowed me to, at every step of the way, have the help and the support I needed to make this project happen. That's perfect. So how much during that process and during all this last year have you had to say no? And when you're saying no, 
what does that look like for a client? Like, let's say you've you've filled up your month and you had a client come through that that could fit the mold, and maybe you 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 stuck to your guns and said no. What did that particular client? What happened to them? Did they get referred to a, a, a you know a, a fellow filmmaker? You know what what was that kind of process? Because I know that a lot of people struggle with the aspect yeah. of saying no. And then maybe even something fits, but what do you do with that? Do you refer it? Do you just say, oh, well, we're busy. You know, we'll do it next month. So, Yeah, you know, with the corporate projects, it's a little easier to manage because you can just kind of push them into the next month. Even though you don't tell them that, you can, you know, you can go ahead and get things moving and get the cycle, get the production cycle going. But you know in terms of the hard days you're going to be spending in filming and editing, you know that you can – slide those into the next month um but um but uh i'm sorry i'm just looking at the links i got distracted um sorry. but in terms of the wedding clients that's a different thing because with weddings it is about dates and it is about not only having the date available to film but then knowing that you want to deliver in a reasonable time and and so yeah i mean it is about it became about to me filling up a month filling up a quarter with the amount of work and time that I wanted to spend, that I knew I could spend, and then knowing I was going to have to turn it away and I was going to have to send it somewhere else and refer it to someone else. And, yeah, that's that's kind of how that looked. And there were times when it wasn't, um, it wasn't the most fun thing to do, but it wasn't a commitment for the project. So and did you, it, go ahead. Michael, if I can ask a follow-up to that, you know, with our corporate projects, <laughs> I mean, we pretty much can control er almost everything like what you're saying in terms of exactly, you know, pre-production, when we're going to edit, and, and in a lot of cases, when we're going to shoot. But lately what's happening with us is, yeah. is the higher level of the executive, the more they, di they dictate when we shoot. You know, because there might be a 30-minute window yeah. on this exact day, and you might find out today that that 30-minute window is tomorrow. How, I mean, have you seen any of yeah. that, and how are, how are you dealing with that kind of stuff? You know, um, I haven't had a lot of that happen to me, um, and and some of it is because most of my work, I think this is probably a bit of a uniqueness for me, and it may not apply to everyone, is that most of my work is out of town. So even though I live in Tampa, Florida, I rarely work here, um, and so most of even my corporate clients are large corporations that are, you know, far away, so even most of my corporate gigs are put together such that we're going to film for three consecutive days and we just have to figure out how to get it done, you know, and we're just going to schedule around it. So, you know, I think there's even something to that that makes me kind of the out-of-town expert and because there's a bit of the urgency in that, that's a little bit helpful to me in terms of that, but, you know, it's not always that way and it isn't that, I don't think that's universal for everybody. Sure. sure. Do you, um, do you find it that, um, Oh, what was I just going to say? I just, I just lost. You got a fault there, Chris? I just lost what I was going to say right there. I was, I was so, so, so listening to what he's, he's got. Well, I mean, you know, my solution has been in a lot of cases, because I, I, I'm kind of facing similar issues in my business now, Brett, not because of a big personal project, but because there's some other companies that I have started that I'm trying to really put more into, but I'm having difficulty um, justifying the time. You know, compared to what yeah. I do with Six Strong Media, I'm mean, very profitable. We make great money, but it's it's sort of like a. I, I tell this story the other day. I used to have this '83 Firebird when I was in college, and boy, when that gas pedal was down, that sucker could fly. But as soon as I let started letting my foot off the gas pedal, it would start slowing down because it had it had zero coast. Like there was no coast in that thing, yeah. and the gas mileage was terrible. But yeah. it, it's kind of that way with Six Strong where. If I'm in it and I'm driving, we're making money, life is good, everybody's happy, except I'm not completely happy because there's other things I want to pursue. But, yeah. me, I mean, it's it's great just to hear that little, this might make this whole call worth it to me, what you said just a few minutes ago in the sense of you say, okay, well, let's let's sort of preload each month with so many hours or, or so much of what I'm going to be involved in and then dedicate the rest of that time to some of these other projects. And what I do is I have some freelancers that I can send to do some of these last-minute shoots or, or do those things to cover for me. Um, but I'm still trying to find that that right mix where because, you know, if it's my top five best revenue customers, I mean, the only person that's going to be on that shoot is me. 
you know, and so that's and that's where I get right. a little bit uh, challenged with that. So I didn't mean to get too far off on a tangent there, but but I love your approach to that, and I'm definitely taking notes, you know, while we talk about it. Well, and Brett, what does your team look like now? Because you had mentioned you were all the way up, and I know Chris has possibly a similar story at one point having seven employees. You know, you had ten employees at one point in time. What does it look like now? Is your team? And if yeah. you're doing your other stuff, is somebody managing things for you, or is it still, is it all you now? Is it just you taking care of the, the you know, the show? Yeah, yeah. I have at this point, I have a business manager that manages, you know, the clients, the accounts, uh, and that sort of stuff, but he's not a production person. Um, you know, he is a business client management, um, you know, accountant type personality and person and everything else is is me in terms of producing and there are people that I bring into every project to help me but there is in terms of thinking like a producer there is nobody else that's full-time on my staff that I can really give ownership of a project to at this point I am the owner of every project we take on but that's exactly at the end of the day for me that's what I wanted and that's what I felt was necessary to get the kind of work and do the kind of projects at the dollar amounts that I wanted. So, you know, I am emotionally, personally engaged in every single one of these projects with every single one of these clients. And um, I have just had to ra essentially bring up my rates to a point where I can afford to do that. So, you know, I no longer have a model that you know, allows me to just send anybody. And frankly, I don't want to take the time to manage them. That's the thing I hated. That's the thing I did not like and I wasn't good at and it never went well and it wasn't my staff member's fault. It was my fault because I really didn't want to engage and I really didn't want to have a meeting every three days and I really didn't want to talk. You know, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do what I was doing. And so for me and for my personality, that really didn't work, which is why I say thank you, God, for the economic collapse, just for me personally in terms of my business. Right. Because even though it was ugly, even though there was some not fun stuff and I went through a lot of things that weren't pleasant and, you know, that wasn't good and I wouldn't want to go through it again, at the end of the day, it got me to where I needed to be for – it was what Brett Culp was built for. I'm doing now what, what I'm built for and not what somebody else I admire or someone else who has a successful business, you know, somewhere else is built for. Well, Brett, I just you, got back. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. I was just going to ask if, if, Brett, can you walk through in, in a little <laughs> bit more uh, detail exactly what that business manager handles for you? Because I think that's huge. And there ain't a whole lot of people in our industry doing what we do that are investing their money in that business manager. You know, we kind of – we hire producers and editors yeah. and shooters, and then we try to be more the business manager. But as you found, what, and, and I found, once our businesses got so big, yeah. we were no longer qualified <laughs> to run the company. Yes. And so, I mean, I mean, you yes. know what I mean? Yes. And, and, and again, and I'm, I'm sure you feel the same way as I do. You know, I feel like I was the most qualified for the, for the production and the creative and all of that. And I want to keep growing my company, so I'm very interested to know more of, of what the business manager, exactly what the business manager handles for you. I mean, yeah, I, mean um, I know it's a lot, but. Yeah, no, 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 I'm happy to answer that. Um, well, first of all, I have to tell you that, that my ace in the hole is that my business manager is my dad. Um, nice. So, so that, that makes it very nice, and obviously it's someone that I can trust, and he's been with me in this business for 11 years now and wow. has gone through all the cycles and seen it. He still doesn't know how to turn on a camera. He still, <laughs> if you said to him, Adobe Premiere tomorrow, he would have no idea what you were talking about. He knows nothing about that. But what he does is he handles all the initial phone calls. So all the tire kickers, all the people that can't afford us, he takes all those calls so that I don't have to deal with that. And he knows enough you know, we kind of joke that he knows the answer to the top 20 questions. So he knows how to answer those top 20 questions. He now knows how to identify whether this is a person that probably has a budget for us or probably doesn't. He knows, and then he can essentially, at a, you know, 
we have a conference call every other day in the morning, first thing in the morning, and he says, here's what's going on. I talk to this person, I talk to that person, and you know, he tells me the new stuff, and then we update what's going on with the clients. So, you know, he's also the real contact. Clients just kind of know that if they email me, it may take them five days for me to eat, respond because I'm neck deep in creative. If they email him, they're probably going to get a reply within 45 minutes. And so once they know that, they always go to him first. They always go to him first because they know that I'm neck deep in creative and I'm probably not going to reply to them for several days. And once they realize he's going to respond quick, everything goes to him. Everything goes to him. And so, you know, that's taking care of that element of the business, um, which was just a natural change anyway. Um, and then, you know, he just updates. He also kind of is the master. It, it, sometimes it changes, but he takes care of generally the schedule. So, you know, when I talked to him this morning, he was like, here's what still needs to be done. Here's where we are editing-wise. What's the priority? What order are we going to do this in? And what needs to take, be, you know, happen here? So, you know, we're working on a, we have a client that's been a longtime client of ours whose son is having a bar mitzvah and want to do a photo montage. So he's like, okay, what do you need? And I'm like, okay, well, what we need is we need all the photos and we need them on this date and we need anything like this and blah, 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 blah. blah. And he says, great, I'll take care of it. And so he calls them up and coordinates that. So he also books all my travel um, and just kind of handles, you know, a lot of that in the glue that sometimes, you know, you need to hold the creative bricks together. Uh, he's the guy that, that makes that happen. Awesome. Well, and what I want to say then is a couple things here is, you know, so is he the one who's who's kind of closing the deal and getting it all, you know, set up? Or once he realizes that they're right, then they're talking to you and you kind of formulate yeah. what the project will look like, put up a proposal, and then you're the one kind of closing that deal. Is that... Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, um, yeah, he does get something special on Father's Day, by the way. But <laughs> that comment there. Um, so, so yeah, what what happens is is that once he's qualified um, the, the the client, and usually then what happens is I we have a conference call and I speak to them, and then I I write a proposal. I put together the proposal, and my proposals, particularly for corporate clients, tend to be long. Um, you know, my corporate, my corporate client proposals can be like eight or nine pages. Um, and, um, but I'm, my background is in writing, um, and journalism. So I do those pretty quick. That might take me 90 minutes to write a proposal like that. Um, and, um, but it's very exhaustive and it's one of the, I'm often told it's the longest proposal they got, most thorough proposal they got, because it wasn't just two cameras for five days with three, I mean, it was very conceptual and very high high level um, in terms of what we were going to accomplish and how we were going to accomplish it. And then, um, and then once I write the proposal, then he coordinates that. Then he sends it to the client. If they have questions, he kind of coordinates getting that to me and, you know, letting me um, um, answer that and understand, you know, what that is and respond. Um, but then, but then once we get through that, then he just handles the management of the client, but I do all the creative. So, you know, now it's really back in my court. And sometimes I'm still saying to him, can you send them an email asking about this or asking about that? Um, or, you know, coordinating schedules, that sort of thing. But then once we get into creative, he's kind of done. And then when the project is finished and all the creative is done, then he's the guy that handles all the final billing, all the, all the whatever. Now with wedding clients, We've been doing weddings together for so long that there are many wedding clients that I am not involved in the process at all. Um, you know, we have this long track record and we have a good history and we have solid work and we're usually referred from pretty solid, warm places. So oftentimes, because he knows the answer to many of the questions, he can kind of answer those questions and, and talk to people and help them understand it. But some of our clients are... You know, and then so, and then a lot of times once that's done in the initial stages and it's secured, then I will schedule a conference call to understand better who they are and what they're about and what we need to do and how we need to do it. But then with some of the bigger wedding clients, there are some weddings that we work with that I have to get on a plane just to go have an appointment with them just to know whether we're going to book. 
Um, but those are clients that it's just an investment of time and money because you know that if you do get booked, it's going to be an amazing job. Well, Chris, I just got a few more, and then we want to get into the uh, the questions. This is great stuff. I'm, I'm loving it. Um, <laughs> this one might be a pretty quick one. Are you, you're probably right now, for what you're doing, not having to do a lot of marketing. Do you feel like things are just coming from the years of the business you've been in and in the word of mouth, or do you still do any kind of active reaching out um, and networking, or are you just having it happen naturally as is the – days and weeks and months pass? You know, it comes in waves. I mean, if you'd asked me this question last November, I would have said, you know, where are the calls? Why isn't the phone ringing? You know, what's going on? And um, so, you know, like in the months of November and December and January of this, even this year, I mean, I was, I was involved in marketing and some networking and just making some connections and being involved in that. Uh, not because I was fearful, but because, you know, it was just a slower time and, um, but, you know, I knew it was going to come back around and then once January started to end, you know, and everybody really got back to going in life and it kicked right back in again. And so it's just cyclical, you know, but the answer is, uh, for me, I never stop marketing and because I'm interested in, you know, one of the challenges that I continually have in my business is that I'm never satisfied to stay where I am. Um, I think if I was satisfied to stay where I am, uh, you know, I probably could rest. You know, if eight years ago I would have been satisfied with fifteen hundred to two thousand dollar wedding videos, I think I could have stopped marketing a long time ago, uh, and we could have just rested there. But I wasn't satisfied with that. I wanted to go do something else. So I mean, and I wanted to raise the price. So now we're marketing again and networking again with a whole other level of people. And then about the time we really got that next level nailed we wanted to go on to the next level and the next level and the next level so the reality is is that every time we have pursued another dream another vision we have to re-network and remarket again to make the connections which is always frustrating particularly like to my dad who's also involved in the marketing because he's like look I just spent three years building this segment and now you raise the prices again and it just totally demolished it what are you doing to me and I'm like look man we're, we're, we're chasing a dream here I don't know where it's gonna lead but you know every step along the way has been another has been the plateau that we needed to get a running start to jump to that next level and so you know I never regret any of those levels I never feel like they've been a waste of time or um, not a good investment of time there's a scene at the beginning of Batman Begins uh, you know the the Batman movie where he's at that concentration camp and uh, the guy is trying to pick a fight with him and he says you know the guy says, "Who?" Batman says, Batman says, who are you? And the guy says, I'm the devil. And he says, no, you're practice. And so there's a lot of devils that I've dealt with in this business over the past 15 years and things that I've been through and difficulties. And every single one of them has been practice to get to the, the next level, to prepare me for the next thing. And there's no question that what we're pursuing right now and what we're doing right now is preparation, practice, for whatever is coming next. That's a great, great answer. It, and kind of my final thing here, and I think we'll go, and then if Chris has anything else, is I was just um, I was just hanging out with a guy who we're going to have on a future expert interrogation who's a branding consultant. He's done stuff for Zappos and Apple and Amazon and all sorts of big brands. And what I found out from him is, you know, a lot of guys, we think that Maybe to grow how much we charge, we're almost having to grow our personnel, grow the people, everybody's doing something different, and then that allows us to charge more money. You, know, you see a lot of companies where there may be, um, you know, there's 8 or 10 or 15 or 50 employees where there's a whole production, you know, and all that different things like you had. But this particular yeah. guy, he was able to charge a super premium by promising that he's the man. Like you're getting him, like that right. personal brand, like there's something to a personal brand that I think people take for granted because everybody goes, well, do I start a company? Do I start something that's, you know, like, you know, get six strong yeah. media or do I have it be Chris Simmons or do I have it be Brett Culp? Like you right. have it now, but you're now able to charge a super premium for a personal brand guaranteeing your love, attention, affection, and, you know, everything to that project. You want to talk on that for just a minute and then guys... Um, we're going to take questions here, so start getting them in, because um, the last 30 minutes here, we're going to, after this answer, we're going to take the questions from you guys, so um, rock and roll. Yeah, yeah, so 
I mean, I think it depends on what you want to build. You know, I am not, I, I realized about myself that I'm an artist. It's the art that I love. And it's the telling of stories, personally doing it, that I love. And, um, you know, so for me, in what I wanted to do and the way I've seen to do it, at least today, ask me again a year from now, who knows uh, where I'll be a year from now and what I'll be doing and the way I'll be doing it. Um, but, but today, I found that the best way to do it is to just bring in the specialists I need, depending on the project I'm working on. You know, if I had a big staff, um, then I could only bring in the people that I could bring, that I had. You know, that's who I would need to bring in, and I would need to keep them busy. So, you know, but instead, because I don't have a big staff and I could work with specialists, I was working on a project in San Diego uh, a year and a half ago, and I realized that the perfect guy to bring in was Joe Simon. And so I called him and hired him, and he came in and shot with me for four days. And it was amazing, and uh, he was amazing. And, you know, if I'd had a big company and a big overhead and staff that I needed to keep busy, I couldn't have done that. I couldn't have chosen to do the art exactly the way I wanted to do the art uh. because I would have had the overhead to keep those people busy. And so, you know, my, my experience, and I know there are other people, you know, somebody like George Lucas or J.J. Abrams would tell you something totally different than what I'm about to say. But what I found was at the level of production I'm at, is that having a big staff, what it means more than anything else is that I've got to take like everything. And I've got to take everything that comes my way because I've got to keep these people busy because I've got to pay them because my monthly nut is 30000 a month or whatever it, it was at one time. And so I can't turn things away. And, and I've got to keep, I gotta keep um, you know, my people going. I got to keep them going. And so if you want to build a business, that's the way to do it because you're investing in building the business. You know, the downside of what I do is that when I get to be 50 years old, I have nothing to sell. There is no business here. There is nothing sellable here. I am the business. And unless I want to sell myself into personal slavery, I have nothing sellable. So, you know, if, if, if that's what you want, if you're building something for retirement, then you don't want what I've built. Uh, you don't want what I'm doing. So my goal is to build something in terms of thinking about retirement is to try to do what I do in a way that's financially profitable enough that I can use the funding that comes in from that and use that to invest in something else. But if you're thinking about retirement, if I'm thinking about retirement, this video business is not my retirement. This business is my passion. It's my art. It's what I love. Man, dude, I am pumped. This is like hit me right in the heart right now it's just it's exactly what i you know wanted to hear and i think a lot of people will truly appreciate that was some great stuff there uh you know really hitting home right now so i i truly appreciate that all right everybody we're at the halfway point get your questions in we're going to try to uh get some rapid fire here brett we appreciate him being on um again guys this is presented by create insights that's chris and i's site uh for for you know helping video professionals take their their businesses to the next level um so if you want to ask a question, you want to chat, if you're in guest mode still, just uh, use the submit a question or try to chat, and uh, you'll be asked to log in. Log in via Facebook, Twitter, or Spreecast, and you'll be ready to rock. And the submit a question button is right below Brett. And so, Chris, take it away, buddy. All right. First question is from Chris. Hey, same name, same spelling and everything. It says, uh, what methodology was used to fund the initial trailer? The production values are high. Yeah, the, this Kickstarter campaign that you're looking at right now was our second funding campaign. The first one we did last April, we did it on Indiegogo because I was a chicken and I didn't know if we were going to hit our goal. And so mm -hmm. when you do it on Indiegogo, you get to keep whatever you raise even if you don't hit your goal. So um, we, we did it that way. And so I created, you know, we spent an afternoon creating this little 90 second like teaser that kind of expressed what we were trying to do with this project. And then um, we heavily campaigned. Um, you know, this particular Kickstarter campaign we're on right now, we met our initial goal in 48 hours, uh, which was just absolutely blew my mind. But it happened because we spent a year, I spent a year, really marketing, selling, sharing this project all over the planet so that 
there were people that were ready for this when it came. Uh, but the answer is is that with that initial Indiegogo campaign, we raised twenty seven thousand dollars, and that was a big borrow and steal twenty seven thousand dollars. I mean, that was a you know everywhere we could get it. I mean, I spent that thirty days, every spare minute I had, you know, absolutely going after it and um, really trying to um, you know get as much funding as we could. So that 27 is what got me through, uh, but, but there was a lot of expenses to this. I mean, we filmed in, I don't even know how many cities we filmed in at this point. It was a lot of travel. There was a lot of work. Uh, but the reality is, is that most of what you see in that trailer, I personally did. Uh, I didn't hire a lot of people. Um, I did a lot of it myself. And that's the power of a passion project, is that you love it, and so you, you, uh, you dive right into it. And roll. All right, next question is from Travis. <laughs> In your process of getting larger and higher dollar projects, have you pursued other businesses or nonprofits to build your portfolio, or have you only taken paid gigs that came your way? I have been blessed to be busy enough that I've really only taken paid gigs. Um, there have been a few projects I have taken at reduced rates just because I really wanted to do them. And both me and the client really thought I was right for it. They just didn't have the um, uh, they just didn't have the budget for my full rate. So there are some reduced rate projects I've taken uh, in the past ten years, but never free projects unless they were things that I thought up that were my idea from the start, and I just wanted to absolutely go after them, and I was pursuing them. We did a music right. video for Sarah Groves, who's my favorite musician in the whole world. I pursued her, I pursued her manager, I pitched the concept, and you know, I think I lost money on that video. But I didn't care, I wanted to do it, it was a dream of mine to do it for her. I, her music got me through a lot of tough times and I almost felt like I owed it to her. Um, and so, you know, that was something, but I pursued that, I wanted that. Now, let me go back 10 years, there were definitely some projects in the early stages of my company that I took because I really wanted um, to, um, uh, yes, and Aaron Thomas, you're right about what I meant by chicken. Um, that's the correct answer. Um, so um, there, were some, there were some projects that I did say yes to because I did want them in my portfolio and I wanted to be able to show them off. But I only did that when I was at the initial stages uh, of my business. And once I really had the real clients coming, I don't, I don't do that anymore. All right, so let's see. Next is our buddy Chris again. Brett, can you explain why you decided to go for a not non for profit angle for the Batman doc? And why? And why and why? Yeah, you really you really <laughs> want to know why, don't you? Um, so so we did it for a couple of reasons. Um, the main reason is is that I this project is about more to me than just making the film. It's about really inspiring people to be to embody the spirit of Batman, um, to bring that into their life. And so, um, you know, it's, it was never about the money to me. Um, I, I want to I wanna make a living and do what I'm doing. Um, and, you know, certainly because it's a not-for-profit doesn't mean that there's not, um, you know, some help for me and the time that I have spent investing in this production in there. It doesn't mean because it's a not-for-profit that there can't be some salary. What it means is um, that that any profitability from the project beyond the production expense, because if I pay myself just in terms of what I invested time-wise in the project, you know, which which is not, I'm not, I'm certainly not going to get my full rate. I'm never going to get my full rate on this project. But you know, you invest some into the expense of that. But when this thing comes in and the distribution happens, uh, this is not about me trying to become wealthy as a business owner. This is about me pursuing that. And so I feel like the viralness of this, I feel like the way to get this to the most people is to make it uh, an inspirational project from beginning to end. And uh, the way to do that is to use the revenue that this project generates uh, once the film is completed um, to inspire people all over the globe. And I think the not-for-profit is what allow, is going to allow us to do that and allow the most people to really get what this project is about. It's about being inspired. And so the more we can involve not-for-profits and charities um, in the, in the uh, project, the better. Awesome. 
And guys, right. I just put his link to his music video in the chat. So if you guys want to see the music video, I just linked it up. It's a phenomenal music video. I love the song. I love the video. Very inspiring. So Chris Thank is you. asking again, how and what tools do you use to, to manage multiple projects at one time? Talk about just your, your, not the technical side, but just kind of if you've got multiple things going at once, how are, how are you keeping all that straight? I think the magic bullet is your dad, but other than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he does help me a lot, uh, but then I have this very low-tech approach, which is these, like, note cards. <laughs> um, and, and I just keep, I have, like, probably, like, 50 of these on my desk right now, right over here. And um, I, I'm, I, but, but generally, but that's where I keep the notes so that I can grab them. Um, but I, I um, this is terrible to say, but I have this... Um, this I keep it all in my head, um, which is like terrible, and I know I'm not supposed to do that, and that's not the answer I'm supposed to give you. Um, but I'm down to the point now where I'm I'm not doing that many projects, and so I'm able to keep it in my head as I go. Um, and you know, I've been asked by some people about this documentary film, like, are you like, are you getting this transcribed? Are you, you know? And the reality is, I have 120 hours of raw footage from this documentary. And most of it's in my head right now. Most of it I actually can remember. Um, you know, not word for word, but I can remember who said what and when they said it and where they said it and where the footage is. And um, um, I can't remember much else. You know, I can't remember where, I, where my car keys are right now, but I can remember <laughs> stories. And so because of that, it kind of is the random access to that. Cool. All right. Sell three productions. The question I had for Brett was in being vested in so many projects, was the concern of the quality slash standard of work were to drop off if someone were to take the lead of a project? I guess if you hand it, you know, yeah, was, the, was the, your, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the issue the issue with that for me, and this is on just a personal visionary artist level, is that uh, on some level, every film of mine that you watch, I don't care who it's for or where it's for, there's a piece of me in it. Um, there's a piece of my heart in it. There's a piece of my soul in it. And if I'm talking to a potential client and I don't feel there's an opportunity for me to put a part of my soul into their story, then I don't take the job. Um, and and that, that lets out some clients. So if I give a project to someone else and they're really the brains behind it, I, I certainly don't want to put the pressure on them to figure out a way to put a piece of my soul in it when I don't even have you know my hand on the wheel. Um, so, so that's kind of the point I've gotten to. Um, it, it's not even just so much about the quality or the client being happy or somebody else being happy uh, outside of me. It's about the I've just reached a point in my career where I want every project to reflect me and that's just personal. That has nothing to do with money. Uh, it's just a personal um, artistic decision. Great. Great. All right. Question from Mike. And Mike, Where do you Mike, want... Mike Folden's going to be uh, on in, a, in March here in a couple weeks. We're excited to have him on today. So uh, thanks, buddy, for the question. Awesome. So where do you want to be in five years, Brett? Yeah, great question. I love it because it, it incites the dreamer in me. Um, the, the, the dreamer in me um, loves to tell people stories and what I, where I want to be in five years is to have a platform where I can um, find great stories and I can share them with people, uh, real life stories. I don't want to tell narrative. I don't want to tell fiction. I don't, wanna, um, I don't want that. Um, I want documentary style work and um, what I'm hoping from this Batman project is that um, it's going to uh, help me build a platform uh, where people will know about my work and be interested in my work and um, allow me to then um, take the voice that I feel like I've been given and I feel like it's a voice that um, is helpful and inspirational to people and I believe that every one of us has that voice somewhere in us it's just a matter of getting in touch with it and believing in it and so I feel like I've spent the past 15 years trying to learn what that voice is for me and defining it and knowing where I can really make it great. And so what I'm hoping is that this project I'm working on right now and other projects I've got going will help me build a platform to share that voice with more people and let people hear it and let them be inspired and let them be more in touch with who they are and who they can be through that process. And um, so the more of it I can do, the better. So 
That's not a clear answer about where I want to be in five years exactly, but that's what I want to be expressing, that's what I want to be doing, and that's where I want to, what I want to be living out in five years. Love it. Awesome. I love it. This is great. All right, Jared Goldberg. <sighs> Berg. Brett, for the end product of Legends, have you been using original music or stock music? Are you looking for original score writers? Jared, what's up, brother? So um, the answer is that yesterday, I think, my answer to that question completely changed. And, um, and so, I, Jared, you're just going to have to wait for the answer, but you're going to like the answer. So, um, so give, me, give me a few days to solidify that. But the answer is that the stock we were originally pursuing some stock options, some licensing options uh, from a certain artist and uh, a conversation yesterday with a nice gentleman in London um, potentially changed the ball game on that. So stay tuned. Cool. All right, this is our buddy Blaine, fellow Create member. Brett, what was, the, up, tipping, what was the tipping point for your current Kickstarter campaign? What have you guys done to get the word out? I think he might have came in late on the conversation, but if you want to just kind of give a quick overview of that again. Yeah, certainly. So, so yeah, we launched this Kickstarter campaign and um, uh, in, um, on a Thursday, and the goal was about $32,000, and um, we hit our goal in 48 hours, which absolutely blew my mind. Um, and I believe the tipping point was the trailer. Um, I truly believe in this case that the, the people seeing that trailer, it just affected them. Um, and um, it wasn't what they were expecting. You know, that's what, you know, we got a, um, so, so we sent out uh, an initial press release right when the trailer went live, which was like uh, 12 p.m. Central Time, uh, about 10 days ago. And um, we got picked up by USA Today, um, and in the article on the in USA Today, and you can just Google it, just Google Legends of the Night USA Today or Brett Culp USA Today. You know, she just spelled it out. The writer just spelled it out. She just said, "This was not what I was expecting when I clicked this," and it just made me cry and it affected me emotionally. And um, so um, I think I think that made a big impact on people. And I think sending out a press release in it. So I think I think the major answer to your question, though I'm babbling a little bit, the major answer to your question is, is that when you find the voice, when you find the insight for your project, and you learn who it connects with, and who your audience is, and you get it in front of them, and it makes that in connection on an emotional, personal level, that's when any project takes off. That's when it launches. And um, in a lot of speeches I've given and conversations I've had, the issue is always finding the, the, the issue to success. I believe is finding where where your passion intersects with the needs of the world. Like where is there an intersection there? Where do those two streets cross? Where does your passion, your personal passion, intersect with what the world needs? And I think for whatever reason, you know, the lightning in a bottle that I couldn't have expected was that there was something in that trailer that really was that connection, that really was that thing. And it took my passion and something I loved and that I had a personal desire for, um, and it connected with what other people needed the day they watched it, uh, the inspiration, the hope, the dream they had. And, um, and when it did that, they were just inclined to share it. And when that happened, the thing just went viral. I mean, I couldn't keep track on Twitter uh, the Tuesday and Friday, the Thursday and Friday, the first 48 hours. It was impossible to even track on Twitter how many times that thing was getting shared. And the, you know, we went from zero views on YouTube to like 60,000 views on YouTube in 72 hours. And this is wow. from just a independent guy's trailer. Um, and now it's circling close to 85,000, depending on when you refresh YouTube, what it says. Um, but um, Anyway, so that's my that's my long answer. That's great, man. <laughs> All right, so Owen, switch it up on us a little bit. He's gonna he's asking what kind of stuff do you do to put your signature on a bar mitzvah montage? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. You know, the answer is that I want to tell a story. So 
I'm working on a bar mitzvah montage right now, and um, this client, um, the, the daughter is kind of shy, and she doesn't want to do anything really cool or out of the ordinary or anything interesting. And so we've been digging, you know, trying to understand um, who she is and, um, and try to find creative ways. So what it looks like we're going to do with this one is we're going to combine a photo montage with a same-day edit from her ceremony. Her ceremony is actually taking place on a Thursday. This is New York. This is the way they do it in New York City, I guess. Uh, so they're doing the ceremony on a Thursday, and then the event is actually, the party is actually on a, on a Saturday. So we're going to do a same-day edit filming of the ceremony, and, and then we're going to intersperse it and intertwine it with this photo montage and kind of tell the story of her coming to this point with some interviews. So the issue is always, I mean, I've never done that before. That's not a template. That's not a pattern. It's just, it's what I have. It's what I've been given in this situation. So the issue is always, who is this person? And how can I tell a story about them that communicates who they are in a way that's very human and very real and very powerful? And um, that's what I'm trying to do with every project, uh, whether it's a bar mitzvah or it's a not-for-profit or it's a corporation. I'm trying to think of everything as if it's a person. And how can we humanize this? How can we put a human face on it? and make it real and make it emotionally connectable because I believe when you can do that then you create something that everyone wants to watch and it doesn't matter who it is it doesn't matter um, what background they are if they can see their face in that film you know symbolically emotionally if they can see themselves in there then it's connectable then they love it and they want to share it great and guys I put the trailer to the uh... Uh, I put the link to the trailer on the chat and everything, so if you guys want to check that out. <clears throat> All right, Mr. Bill Grant, how do you pre-qualify an interview to make sure of how they're going to be on camera, or do you interview everyone and sort them out in post? I assume you're talking about like a corporate or not-for-profit project, Bill. Um, so, or, maybe, um, or maybe even the documentary. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for the documentary film. Yeah, um, so uh, I've done a lot of Skype. Yeah, okay, documentary, good. So I've done a lot of Skype calls. Um, I do an initial phone call and um, and kind of figure out who they are and what they're like, and then we do a Skype call, and that gives me the information I need to know. Now, sometimes, um, um, some. I'm sorry, these chat things distract me. I'm, I have such ADD. So, um, the, the um, what was I saying? Oh, I'm so lost. I'm so dumb. You're talking about, you're talking um, about the, the Skype interviews. interviews. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you can't Skype interview though everybody that I've interviewed, um, you know. And and so sometimes you have to just go in, you know, you go in with the main person who's the subject, and I know that's going to be a good interview. But I have no idea whether their mom's going to be a good interview, whether their boss is going to be a good interview. And with that, we just try to go in and get as many interviews done as we can in as short amount of time as we can. These Batman shoots have been absolutely insane. I've gone in for like 36 hours on most of them, and I've shot for 16 you know, hours the first day. And we just start with the early birds in the morning and then go until late at night and then crash and then do it again four hours later. And um, so it's been – those shoots have been pretty intense to get the most bang for the buck on these trips. Uh, but, yeah, some of the interviews have worked and some of them haven't, but – I do feel like uh, that's another gift I have. Um, again, I don't do a lot of things well, but one of the things I do well is figure out in about five minutes how to get about any person to give me a few good sound bites on an interview. And I don't think I've ever in the history of my life stopped an interview until I had at least three sound bites that I knew were usable. All right. In building your business, what were the key decisions led to build a staff? then to work solo or just stay within the family. <laughs> yeah, you know, in, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. The, economy, the economy is what altered that. I mean, initially the growth of my business was driven by the fact that we kept getting more calls um, for work. And I think if I were to do it all over again, um, I would have, um, I think the mistake that I made in the early days of my business is that, and this is the analogy I use, is that I went wide in my business before I went deep, which is to say that what I should have done is that instead of taking on more work, I should have kept raising the prices. And then when I got the prices to where I wanted to be, which is essentially depth, going deeper or going higher, 
with my prices, then once I got there, then I should have gone wide and now start accepting. So, so I think by raising prices, you can slow down your volume. My hands look gigantic. These, these lenses are so funny. So by raising your prices, I know, so weird. So by raising your prices, um, you can go, um, you know, higher without, without doing more work. You can keep going up the food chain, and then when you get to the top of it, then go as wide as you want, um, and knowing that you've already reached that kind of plateau. Um, so, so I mean, my original decision was to raise the prices, uh, or was to just do more, just hire more people and do more and get a little piece of what everybody was doing uh, in the company uh, as the business owner, and then the economy changed, and I had to find a new way, but ultimately in doing that, found a way that was really better for me and my voice and what I love. Well, then we might we might have to get you back on here to just talk about business model because, like, that's the kind of thing. Like, when you're going deep to see how high you get those prices prices raised, that's when you absolutely have to keep your overhead to almost nothing until you can just I mean keep yeah. testing and testing, and you can afford to lose nine out of ten proposals, you know, because you're going to perfect that yeah. that marketing message that talks to that you know, company or whoever that can pay those huge rates. And that's just, that's an enormous topic that I think if people knew yes. even just 5% five, 5 more than they know now, they're six, I mean, they could double, triple, even quadruple their revenues, you know, really without a, a huge effort. But anyway, that, that's a sidetrack. But yeah. I just, I, let's, let's think about that, Michael, for future calls, man. I think that would be a good, you know, if we're just focusing on the, the actual business model itself. All right, so Jonathan Fritzler, how does Jonathan, music? Thank you so much, man, for everything, buddy. He's been a, a new guy, sending us all sorts of cool stuff. We we love his we love his enthusiasm. So rock and roll, man. Thanks so much. Awesome, man. So how how does music influence your stories? You know, I have a vision in mind of what I want to do and what story I want to tell, and then the search begins for the music, um, and the music that matches that, and. Uh, you know, I have this thing where I get to the point where I just say, you know, this music tells this story. Like, I can feel this story in this in this song. Like, I can feel it. Now, of course, I'm coming to it knowing what the story is. Um, but, yeah, I, I, am lis I feel like I can hear the story, that same story in there. The beauty of music is that anybody can hear a story, and they hear different stories depending on what they bring to the song when they hear it. So... So yeah, I'm I'm listening. Um, I'm 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 li I'd listen to songs, but of course I have like a different vibe because my background was in wedding video and wedding filmmaking. Uh, I was always um, listening, you know. I was always editing around the song. So you know these Hollywood guys that know how to you know edit a video, edit a film, and then they have the score guy come in and score it. I have no idea how to do that. Like absolutely no idea. You have to give me some music to start with, but I once I find the music that I feel tells the story, then I kind of edit with it and edit around it and reloop it, and then, then the images and the audio from the video and the music are I'm kind of working them and finessing them to get them exactly the way I want so that it all connects. Um, but we have to stop here for just a second because we've got a few left, but I want to be very respectful of Brett's time. Um, we can cut it off right this second, but uh, I don't know how much time you have left. I know you have a ton of things going on right now. You've got another spree cast. Um, how many more do you want to take? There's, there's, there's a few left. I can do 15, uh, I can do 15 more. I can do 15 more minutes. Okay, there we go. 15 more minutes, guys. We'll get That's, no more questions. Don't, don't cue anything else up. Here we go. Then let's just let's lightning answers, all right, Brett? Like soundbite responses here, okay? I'm ready. All right, I'm so, ready. Let's do it. <laughs> can't resist can't resist to ask a geeky question, but why Batman? Was it a project you always wanted to do, or were other ideas characters already taken? No, no, Batman. I mean, I to my knowledge, this concept has not been done for any fantasy sci-fi character that I know of. Nobody's done it in fiction, you know, exactly the way I'm doing it uh, here. Um, but but yeah, Batman has just been with me my whole life, and. When I look back on photos of my life, there's Batman t-shirts, Batman birthday cakes, Batman action figures. It's just been there with me forever. Some of the first movies I ever made were stop-motion animation Batman movies with action figures. One of my first live-action movies that I ever made when I was like 12 years old was me and a Batman cowl and the whole Michael Keaton 
Steel and you know the whole thing. And so this thing's just been with me my whole life. I love Batman. I'm a huge Batman fan. My parents, my grandparents, everybody, you know, encouraged that. And um, so it was a natural choice for me. Yeah, thanks. This it, it, is cool. And um, you know, it was a natural choice for me, and just absolutely a passion thing for me. And um, just has been something with me my whole life and was a great way to talk about the power of storytelling and contemporary mythology which is really what this documentary is about more than anything else um, it's about the power of storytelling and mythology uh, to work in our lives even today which frankly is what we do every time we make a wedding film we're creating a folklore a mythology for a family that they will pass on and tell for generations to come and I was fascinated with how that worked, and Bat there was no better character on the planet to do that with than Batman. All right. Bill Grant, okay, you shut down my world and in focus when you asked what was truly standing in the way of our dreams. Can you just tell me? I'm having a hard time with it. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, what stands in the way of our dreams is, is you know, um, I, 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 one of the smartest things I ever had say to me, said to me was that your problems aren't your problems. Um, and what they meant by that is when you sit down today and, and write down what you think your problems are and why you can't do this or why you can't do that or why this is an issue, if you really go deeper, you'll find that the problem is not uh, that. That's not the problem. The problem is you. You're the problem. Um, and, and you are the one that's the problem. That, that's the bad news. The good news is, is that because you're the problem, you also get to be the solution. So you don't have to wait on somebody else to give you permission to do your dream, to make it happen. You don't have to get permission for it. You can just go do it and, and find a way. And what I have found is, and this is what this project has confirmed for me more than anything else, is that when you dedicate yourself to something you believe in something and you're willing to do the hard work to bring it to the world and you're willing to sacrifice time money you know the TV shows you wish you could be watching I really would like to have watched a little more Walking Dead and I haven't watched it oh, gosh. Um, but <laughs> I'm, but I'm making but I can't watch Walking Dead I can't watch Breaking Bad I'm making a movie and so you know that's what I have had to sacrifice to make this movie and, you know, what I find is, is that when I'm willing to make that sacrifice, that the world, and I, I'll just say, because it's in my life, God seems to conspire to make that thing come about in a way that's beyond what I could have asked or imagined. And that's what I'm experiencing right now. And that's what I want every single person in the world to experience on some level, because it, it, it changes the way you see your life. Awesome. All right, James Price, what's your game plan for distribution for the documentary? Ask me again in three months. <laughs> okay. All right, Jonathan's asking, I can tell your spirituality has shaped your life and vision for your company and work. Any examples? I think you just gave one, but maybe you want to. Yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll just say to that that, um, that everything that's happened right in my life Everything that's happened good in my life, it's because God gave it to me. And everything that's happened bad in my life, it's because I got in the way. Um, and um, so, not everything. That's probably an overstatement. But, but you know, um, it's absolutely been a big part of my life. And spirituality is huge for me. And um, I don't know how I'd get through a day without it. All right. Estefania has asked... Uh, maybe elaborate a little bit more. Can you talk about how you go about hitting the emotional aspect of each project? Yeah, so so with every project, I'm I'm asking myself, how is this event? How are these people? How is this organization? How is this corporation making the world a better place? So the question is, so I'm at a wedding today, you know, how is this wedding making the world a better place? How is this not for profit? making the world a better place? How's this company making the world a better place? How's this person I'm profiling making the world a better place? And um, when I can answer that question adequately, then that becomes the emotional core that everything else hangs on. Everything else just goes around it. And if I can't find it, then I'm out of here, man. I ain't doing this project. Um, so, you know, that is 
Because what I find is that when you can find the answer to that question, you get to the heart of what makes everything emotionally connectable. Um, because I am most emotionally connectable when I'm making the world a better place. And I'm most attractive to people when I'm making the world a better place. And the moment I start trying to just make my life better is the moment I become less attractive. And the moment that an organization focuses on that is the moment they become less attractive. And they become more attractive when they focus on what they're doing that's making everybody else's life better and not themselves better. And so the more you can do that, um, the, more, um, the more powerful and emotional the story becomes. Do you find, Brett, that, I mean, is that kind of, and you hate to connect it to a sales pitch, but I mean, is that kind of your message that, that gets a client to want to do business with you versus somebody else? And how often are you in a situation where the client just doesn't agree? I mean, we see projects, we get projects all the time that it's just like, this is the script, this is what we want to produce. And I'm like, you know what, it, that's not going to work. I'm not going to have a good time with that. But it's for a really good client. So you kind of just, ha you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a weird thing. We don't have to get off too far. But how often are you in yeah, situations yeah, yeah. where, you know, you think it should be one way, but the client has said, no, we really need it to be this way. If I am neck deep in a project and it starts to go that way, then I just kick myself and learn a lesson and, you know, I fight a little bit and then we move on and then typically I don't work with that client again. Um, yeah. If I can tell that that's the way it's going to be from the start, uh, I rarely work with clients, rarely, unless it's like a personal friend or a long-term connection. I rarely work with a client when they already have a full vision defined. If they already have a full vision, vision and, and frankly, usually it takes care of itself, because if they have a full vision defined already, usually I just say to them, you know what, I'm way too expensive for you. Um, you know, if all you want is somebody that can do a very good video job of executing your vision, you should hire somebody else. You pay me my fee because you want the value added of what emotionally and conceptually I bring to the project. And if you don't need that in the project, and, and you've already got that defined, then you're going to overpay for me. And typically, that does the trick. They go away. Great answer. Cool. Great. How will you choose Nick! to premiere the film? <laughs> I think we're going to premiere it in Tyler, Texas, Nick. <clears throat> Does that sound good? I, I don't know. I don't know yet. Um, the, the, short answer, the short answer is um, I got an email from San Diego Comic-Con uh, recently, and so... Um, it may be July in San Diego. We'll see. Awesome. Have to be out there. You got, I got, can't wait for that announcement. Mike Gorga, long time uh, social media buddy of mine, says, tell Brett, thanks for making a 59-year-old filmmaker tear up in about one minute of that trailer. <laughs> That's awesome. 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 Good. Share it. If you're 59 years old, share it. find a five-year-old to share it with, and you can both you can cry and he can giggle. <laughs> All right, this last question, I'm, I'm not even sure what, we're, what he's talking about at this point. He says, how do you get those sound bites? So I don't, I don't know. Uh, Is that in the trailer? Maybe that's, talking maybe, about yeah, the trailer that, if, that, first? if that's relevant, then, then go ahead and answer that. I'm not sure what he means by that. Yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, you know, you shoot, even if, even if a, a monkey shoots for 120 hours, they get enough sound bites to make a trailer like that, right? So, no, I mean, you know, the answer is, you know, in, in Hollywood they have this term called killing your babies, and it's about, you know, having to go through and um, take these things that you really love and that you're really excited about, passionate about, and leaving them on the cutting room floor just because they don't work or they don't fit. And, you know, the reality of this project is that um, there were so many babies killed in the making of that trailer, you'll never even know because... You know, the finished, you know, 70 to 80 minute movie um, is going to have everything in it that I want. So, you know, the issue is always uh, keep people talking and get and try to steer them to the heart of what you're looking for. So I always kind of have in my mind when I go into a shoot, in general terms, what this story is about. I'm, I'm flexible and open to finding something different in it. But um, 
But you know, I'm looking for that, and then the issue is how can that person express that to me in a powerful way? And a lot of times I'll provoke them. <clears throat> you know, I'll find something that I know um, speaks to something emotional for them, and we'll just start talking about that. You know, and I'll say, let's just take a break from the interview for a minute. So, tell me about your son. You know, tell me about what you love about your son, and what you, and, and get them to the emotional space that you want them to be in. Um, with the thing that they love, and that that often uh, helps tremendously. All right, so we got uh, one final question from some dude named Gebs. I don't know who that is. So, <laughs> so the question for me is that I love the fact that you've gotten out of your own way, and that you've said, you know what, this is who I am. This is what I stand for. This is what I'm going for. Can you please give some inspiration to the people out there who feel like, well, I've always just got to pay the bills. I've got to do this, and I've got to say yes to everything, even though some identify possibly what they'd rather be doing, who they'd rather be, but they're not in that position or they think they're not. How do you make that transition to go, you know what? I'm going to stop saying yes to these things that don't fill me up, you know, don't let me live my passion, um, and just say no and go right towards the things that fit, if that makes sense. Because so many people do that. You hear them go, well, I just got to pay the bills. And yeah. they'll say, I got to pay the bills till they're blue in the face. And, you know, um, so I just would love to hear your answer on that, and then that's it. So, um, give some yeah, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to end up. I'm going to end up going past 415, if that's okay with you. Um, so uh, we'll just shuffle something here, because I'm going to I'm going to tell you a story, um, and 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 it's a story that speaks to just the fact that we get to choose what our identity is. Um, you know, I think I think the challenge with most of that of what you're talking about is we get stuck in paradigms of who we think we are and what we think we have to do, and most of those paradigms are not true. Um, um, most of those paradigms aren't real. Um, several years ago, uh, we started having some challenges with my son when he was in kindergarten. He was uh, not performing well and couldn't keep up with the assignments, and he was having some social problems. <clears throat> so we started taking him to some doctors um, to try to understand what was going on with him, and we started getting words like autistic and um, sensory processing and you know all these words that you know, you don't want to hear and no parent wants to have said to them. And, um, you know, finally we ended up after several, several months of going to these sessions and these having him take these tests and all this stuff, um, we ended up with the main specialist who had all the, um, all the tests in front of her and was looking at all these things. <clears throat> and she said, look, I, I, um, I just like to be frank about these things. I don't like to, you know, um, beat around the bush or, or not be clear, you know, Judah, your son, has a very low IQ, and he has this challenge, you know, he's never going to be able to function in a normal school environment, he's never really going to have friends, he's probably not going to be able to have like a real job, he's not going to be able to perform on grade level, all these things she said, and, uh, you know, it was devastating because it wasn't... Um, it wasn't what you want to hear as a parent. So my wife and I, we um, we left that meeting, and we walked down, you know, got in the elevator and walked to the car, and we're the type of couple that, you know, we don't talk till we get in the car and the doors are closed, <clears throat> and we know we're by ourselves. And so we, um, we sat down in the car, and the door shut, and I just sat there for a minute. I didn't want to start the car because I thought, you know, she might want to say something, and I wanted to be able to listen to her, and so we just sat there for about 30 minutes, and, and she looked over at me, and she said, that is a lie. That's a lie. That is not our son. I know our son, and that's not our son. That's not him. That's not who he is. And um, she then proceeded to spend the next year proving that that woman was a liar, and she did it. And he went to all kinds of specialists. She completely changed his diet. She went through all these exercises and techniques and things that were just, I was like, what, in, what is this we're doing here? Why are we driving all the way across the world to go see this specialist about this, about that? 
And the reality is, is that now he's in the third grade, and he's right on grade level, and he has lots of friends, and he just played Santa Claus in the holiday musical. And, you know, he's got his moments, and he's got things that he has to do different. And he's not like your average kid, but he's doing great. And, you know, what I realized in, in that cycle is that what most of us do is we're reactive. And we let the world define who we are and who we're going to be. And we let external forces define who we are and who we're going to be. And we have chosen as a family to be reactive, which means to be proactive, excuse me, to be proactive, which means we get to define who we are and you don't. And we get to define where we're going and you don't. And so there's sometimes, even when you sit in a room with an expert who knows so much more than you do, who thinks they know everything, and you feel like a nobody, and you're like, man, you know, I don't know what I'm talking about. This lady's an expert. How can she be wrong? There are just times when you're a right nobody, and they're a wrong expert. And um, I think the key to that is to get a dream in your heart that is who who you want to be and what you want to do and not let it be defined by what your accountant tells you and not let it be defined by what the numbers tell you and not let it be defined by what your your production work last year told you and instead follow what's in your heart about what you know about your family about what you know about your work about what you know in your heart about your destiny and pursue that and let that drive the show and don't let anything else drive it let that drive it. And when you let that drive it, then all that superficial stuff, all those bookings and prices and we can't do that in this market and my clients would never go for that, it all just goes out the window because that's all the external junk. That's all the, that's all the reactive stuff. It's time to get proactive to think like a producer, like a Hollywood producer does. Hollywood producers don't take no for an answer. They just push and push and push and push until it happens the way they have it in their mind that it will happen. And that's the kind of mentality we need to get as fil independent filmmakers is that we're going to follow these dreams and we're not going to let anything stop us and we're not going to be hampered by these superficial complaints and whines and all that stuff. We're going to do this stuff and we're going to go after it. And so I don't know if that answers your question, Michael, but that's the best answer I have today. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. <laughs> Shut it down. Shut it down. Uh, we're not going to say it, anything. I, I mean, dude, I, I appreciate you. I commend you. You're a huge inspiration to so many people. And, uh, you know, I, I know that the rest of this year and the future years are, are going to absolutely rock for you. And I, I can't wait to connect, um, you know, in the future with you. Um, I've had, uh, what's his name on here? Bill Grant says me and you are one in the same. So I, I totally connect uh, with you. I, I love everything that you said. Uh, just thank you so much, my friend. Thank you so much. So we'll, we'll let you go here. We're, we'll see a few things to end it out, but, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll click you off, but, but thank you so, so, so much. Thanks, Brent. I appreciate, appreciate it. Bye everybody. You, God bless. Thank you. Thanks buddy. Holy smokes. Wow. <laughs> Wow. Amazing, man. It's amazing. Uh, that was absolutely incredible. I don't even know that I want to well, say much more today, guys. Uh, Chris, if you want to add anything, I mean, that was just awesome. I will say, actually, I will say a few things. Um, so, you know, we'll have a replay of this um, available after the call. It'll be available instantly after the call because if you guys missed any of this call, you're going to absolutely want to rewatch the entire thing uh, over and over again to get it in your head because um, Brett was just awesome. And there'll also be right below the call, it says transcript. Uh, in a few days, you'll be able to go there, drop down, you'll see um, all the questions that were asked during the call, all the links that were mentioned in the call, and uh, you'll be able to go right to those sections in the, um, you know, with the time code, because I'll have a timestamp saying this question happened here, boom, you go right there. Uh, if you guys want to get on our email list above or below the call on expertinterrogations.com, um, you can sign up and um, you know you can get on our list to be notified so you don't miss any calls. We always send an email out right before the call so that you guys you know know what's happening, knows who's coming on the call. Um, 
And so rock and roll, uh, Chris, if you want to want to finish that oh, off. Um, yeah, I just, and if you if, if you do sign up for that email list, you'll get a uh, you know free copy of my six figure videographer ebook, uh, which is you know really the the highest selling product that we have. Um, we've decided to give it away just because we think that it's uh, something that we'd like to share with everybody. And, and at the very least, if, if you can consume that information, it can help you grow your business, then, then we've done our job. Um, if you want to kind of get, you know, look at a resource that's more about the nuts and bolts of, of how to, you know, the actual business side of, of your company. I mean, you know, what Brett was talking about is very inspirational, a lot about the creative types of things. Um, what we do every week, you know, Wednesdays at 2 p.m., and actually if you go to, to our website, createinsights.com slash coaching, um, you'll see a lot of the different uh, things that we offer inside that coaching program. But the biggest thing is every, you know, every Wednesday at 2 o'clock for two hours, Michael and I are answering questions of our members that relate to everything about running a company. We've got marketing, selling, writing proposals, you know, financial, you know, projections, I mean, budgeting, I mean, things that, that really you're just not going to get access to anywhere else. Um, we're open books. You know, we don't, we don't uh, you know, hide anything that we're that. doing. I mean, it's very transparent. And uh, I think some of the other guys on the call that our members can, can attest to, you know, that we're really just kind of pouring everything out there to help you guys be more successful. So definitely, if you check that out, that'd be great. Um, and, you know, there is a free trial, so you can definitely test, uh, take a test drive before you invest anything, but uh, certainly hope to see you guys there. Thanks again for joining this call, and we will uh, you know, see you soon. We got Carl Olson on Thursday, guys. Chris will be on with, uh, well, we'll both be on with Carl Olson on Thursday, so we're super excited about that, and uh, thank oh, you guys so much, and again, yeah. thank Brett Cole. So, rock on. All right, guys. See you Thursday.